A writer named Damon Young, in a publication called The Root, which was once owned by the Washington Post, wrote a piece called Whiteness is a Pandemic. It came out right after a man murdered eight people in Atlanta, six of whom were Asian American, two were white, one Hispanic was injured. But as far as Mr. Young is concerned, the whites and the injured Hispanic just flies. Mr. Young wrote, Whiteness is a public health crisis. It shortens life expectancies. It pollutes air. It constricts equilibrium. It devastates forests. It melts ice caps. It sparks and funds wars. It flattens dialects. It infects consciousnesses. And it kills people. White people and people who are not white, my mom included. Now, apparently, Mr. Young's mom died of cancer, and he feels that it was misdiagnosed or not diagnosed because she was black, and that she only began receiving good care after she had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. So he blames the system, the man, white people, somehow, some way, I guess. He continues, there will be people who die in 2050 because of white supremacy-induced decisions from 1850, end of quote constricts equilibrium, infects consciousnesses. A line can and should be drawn from the actions of the white supremacists who stalked into three Atlanta area massage parlors yesterday and allegedly killed eight people, six of whom were of Asian descent, to the relentless anti-Asian rhetoric pollinating national discourse over the past year. The former president, and the party of the former president can and should be blamed for this and the sudden increase of racist violence against Asian Americans. <laughs> the former president and the former president's party and presumably all of those who voted for him should be blamed? The line doesn't stop there though. It extends back 400 years and has tentacles clawing everywhere white supremacy exists here in America, which is everywhere. There is a line connecting this act of terror to the 11 people killed at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018 and the nine people killed at the Emanuel American Methodist Episcopal Church in 2015, of course, but also to gentrification, to redlining, to racial profiling, to gerrymandering, to voter suppression, to mass incarceration, to the war on drugs, to the sum prime mortgage crisis, to the vast disparities in both COVID deaths and who receives COVID vaccinations, to how men and women who stormed the Capitol just went home and had dinner with their families afterwards. While we were still processing and recovering from what we witnessed, they were already back on their couches watching Criminal Minds. And Mr. Young finishes with a flourish. White supremacy is a virus that, like other viruses, will not die until there are no bodies left for it to infect, which means the only way to stop it is to locate it, isolate it, extract it, and kill it. I guess a vaccine could work too, but we've had 400 years to develop one, so I won't hold my breath, end of quote. <laughs> wow, <laughs> where do you start with this? Let's start with this. The racial group that commits the greatest percentage of hate crimes against Asian Americans is blacks, followed by whites at roughly 24%, blacks are at 25%, followed by Asian criminals at 24%. So the greatest percentage of hate crimes committed against Asian Americans is committed, Mr. Young, by blacks. These are not Donald Trump supporters. This is from the Washington Examiner, quote, that the left seems to need to blame every ailment of society at the feet of white people, conservatives, and Trump himself lacks any form of seriousness. While there are some violent perpetrators who are white, conservative, or Trump supporters, FBI stats suggest that most anti-Asian violence has come from black perpetrators. Refusing to look at these stats represents a refusal to take seriously the lives and securities of Asian Americans. According to the DOJ, 27.5% of all violent Asian crimes against Asian Americans in 2018 were committed by black people. That's over 50,000 incidents in a single year. 
White criminals and Asian criminals each account for 24.1% of all attacks on Asians. And Asian people, similar to their white counterparts, are underrepresented in violent crimes committed in proportion of the population they make up, which means black Americans are overrepresented at 13% of the population. As to Mr. Young's apparent assertion that white people by definition are villains, do you know who rapper KRS-One is? If there is a Mount Rushmore of rappers, he's on it. Doesn't sound like KRS-One agrees with Mr. Young. This movement for freedom always existed within the United States. In the United States, we have a huge abolitionist movement, people who are against slavery. And most of them are white people, to be honest with you. Uh, in the United States. Most of the people who are against slavery in the United States are white people. You would, think, <laughs> you would think that black people would be the ones at the forefront of the abolitionist movement, and, and we are. I mean, I could quote Frederick Douglass, I can go to Nat Turner, I could talk about uh, Harriet Tubman and, and others. But when you look at the historical change, we, we can fight. We fight, we riot, we protest. But when it comes to the courts, the laws, the mood of society, religion, white people, white Americans have been at the forefront, have been the leaders of black freedom. Now, black people don't want to say that. I don't know why, but it's the truth. <laughs> what? The truth is, Barack Obama was not elected by black people. Even if all the black people in America voted for Barack Obama, he still wouldn't win because we're that small of a group in the United States. Latinos, whites, they say we want him, black man in office. Regarding the inherent evil of white people, Malcolm X was once approached by a female college student who asked, Mr. X, what can I do to help? And he responded, nothing. He later on said he regretted that response. Here's what he wrote. I know better than most Negroes how many white people truly wanted to see American racial problems solved. I knew that many whites were frustrated as Negroes. I'll bet I got 50 letters some days from white people. The white people in meeting audiences would throng around me after I had addressed them somewhere. What can a sincere white person do? When I say that here now, it makes me think of the time that little co-ed I told you about, the one who flew from her New England college town to New York and came up to see me in the Nation of Islam's restaurant in Harlem. And I told her there was nothing she could do. I regret I told her that. I wish that now I knew her name or where I could telephone her or write her and tell her what I tell white people now when they present themselves as being sincere and ask me one way or another the same thing that she asked." End of quote. And economist Tom Sowell has written about how it was Western civilization that began to question the morality of slavery. Another cliche that has come into vogue is that slavery is America's original sin. The great Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said that a good catchphrase could stop thinking for 50 years. Catchphrases about slavery have stopped people from thinking for it even longer than that. Today, the moral horror of slavery is so widely condemned that it is hard to realize that there were thousands of years when slavery was practiced around the world by people of virtually every race. Even the leading moral and religious thinkers in different societies accepted slavery as just a fact of life." End of quote. Indeed, it was Western civilization that became morally repulsed by slavery. No one wanted to be a slave, but their rejection of slavery as a fate for themselves in no way meant that they were unwilling to enslave others. It was just not an issue until the 18th century, and then it became an issue only in Western civilization. Neither Africans, Asians, Polynesians, nor the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere saw anything wrong with slavery, even after small segments of British and American societies 
began to condemn slavery as morally wrong in the 18th century. What was special about America was not that it had slavery, which existed all over the world, but that Americans were among the very first peoples who began to question the morality of holding human beings in bondage. That was not yet a majority view among Americans in the 18th century, but it was not even a serious minority view in non-Western societies at the time, end of quote. How bad is America where whites, pandemic whites, are over 60% of the population? Here's what black Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson wrote back in 1991. Quote, the sociological truths are that America, while still flawed in its race relations and its stubborn refusal to institute a rational universal welfare system, after all, he is a sociologist. Have you ever met a conservative? Of course he wants a bigger welfare state. But back to what he said about America and racism. America is now the least racist majority white society in the world, has a better record of legal protection of minorities than any other society, white or black, offers more opportunities to a greater number of black Americans than any other society, including all of those of Africa. And about linking today's problems to slavery and Jim Crow? New York Times writer Nicholas Kristof, I'm quoting you, asserts that there is, overwhel I'm qu you're quoting him, overwhelming evidence that centuries of racial subjugation still shape inequity in the 21st century, quote, closing quote, and he mentions, open quote, the lingering effects of slavery, close quote. And now this is Tom Sowell. If we wanted to be serious about evidence, we might compare where blacks stood 100 years after the end of slavery with where they stood after 30 years of the liberal welfare state. Yes. Explain that. Well, in 1960, which would be almost 100 years after the end of slavery, 22% right. of black kids grew up in homes with only one parent. Just 22%? Yes. Four out of five were in homes with both parents. Yes. Uh, 30 years later, after the liberal welfare state, that number had more than tripled. And so I said, well, let us compare. If, if we, we can speculate on how much that 22% was due to the legacy of slavery. But we know that that tripling was not due to the legacy of slavery. It was due to the legacy of a whole different set of policies. Back in 1997, CNN and Time did a massive survey of black teens and white teens. And more black teens and white teens said failure to take advantage of available opportunities is a bigger problem than racism, end of quote. Isn't that the issue? Isn't the issue the failure to make a distinction between men and boys, as again, rapper KRS-One has outlined? There's two types of people in the world, black men and black boys. Black boys is who you see on mainstream television. I want the girl, uh, the big house, uh, I'm driving the car. That's little boy stuff. And any man will let you know, any man knows that. Any adult knows that. Now I'm not saying that when you're on TV you can't aspire for the good things in life, no doubt. But a man, a real man, he gets on the TV and first, he looks for his kids. <laughs> Let me make sure my kids ate today. Are they clean today? Did they learn something today? Uh, are they protected today? Before I can even talk to you, is my kids good? It's a man. Is my woman good? Is she, feel, is she empowered? Does she feel like she can breathe? Is she expressing herself? Does she feel love? What's my woman doing? Most of the rappers you see on TV, they have no woman in their life. They have little girls who are only interested in little boys. So they play little girl, little boy games. Mm -hmm. I want the guy with the car. <laughs> That's a little girl, a little boy. I can't argue with that. Leave all that over there, okay? There's a little girl, little boy arena that rappers play into. But the majority of us are men and women. The majority.
majority of us. Finally, Mr. Young, if you're still watching, we end with a quote from Aristotle. I know he's white, but still. Anyone can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way, this is not easy. Mr. Young, I'm Larry Elder. We've got a country to save. <laughs> See you next time. Now, programming note, we have been completely demonetized by YouTube. Why am I smiling? Because it means we must be doing something right. Now, in order to get me uncensored and on demand, all you have to do is go to LarryTube.com. That's right, just LarryTube.com because we've got a country to save.